Our second speaker is John Detmer from University of Victoria here in Canada, and we're speaking about sequential transdimensional Monte Carlo for seabed parameter inference. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. I'll uh, jump right in here. So the field I'm working in is probably pretty unknown to most people here, so I'll, spend, I'll try to spend quite a bit of time uh, to motivate what, what I want to do. So the, the goal in, in this work is that we try to examine mesoscale seabed variability, and by that we mean um, variability that is of the order of um, uh, meters to uh, perhaps a, a kilometer. And, and so over those kind of scales, we want to examine how seabed properties um, such as sound velocity, density, and attenuation uh, change along a track of interest. And uh, we want to do this by carrying out inference on, on large data volumes that are collected with a deep-toed acoustic source and receiver array. Okay, so, and, and one of the, uh, the things that we are in particular interested in is that we, we'd like the data to determine the, the, uh, this 2D, what we call a geoacoustic model. So a geoacoustic model kind of lumps in all these uh, parameters such as uh, uh, layer thicknesses and uh, uh, sound velocity, density, and attenuation of the seabed. Could also have other parameters such as um, uh, scattering uh, properties and so on. And, um, and in particular, we'd like uh, the, this, the, these data that we're collecting to determine uh, how many uh, layer or how, what the number of layers is that are supported by the data. Um, so the approach that we'd like to use is a, uh, as a sequential Monte Carlo method um, that allows us to efficiently analyze, or we call it in our field, invert these uh, uh, many data sets. And, and we'll use a, a trans-dimensional formulation, a reversible jump Markov chain um, approach to determine the parameterization and, and also use a yield important sampling um, that permits us to handle uh, data that have a very high information content or a very peak likelihood function. And I'll show a couple of examples. Uh, one is a simulation that we uh, designed to kind of test uh, our method and see if it works at all. And uh, then I'll present some, oops. No, that was the, the classic um, hitting the wrong button here. The, um, and then some uh, data that we collected on the Malta Plateau in the Mediterranean just off the coast of Sicily. And um, this data was acquired by an auto autonomous uh, underwater vehicle that moved along a track towing a, a, an, an array and an acoustic source. So why are we interested in, in mesoscale uh, lateral variability? Well, in um, the, the acoustic uh, propagation in shallow water, and by shallow water we mean anything of the order of a hundred to a few hundred meters water depth, so the typical continental shelf areas. Um, and and the, the propagation there is dominated by bottom interactions because the sound mostly propagates by bouncing back and forth between the surface and the seabed. And um, it's, it's very difficult uh, to separate the physical mechanisms uh, currently that contribute to certain um, uh, uh, features in measured data that we see uh, for long range propagation in, in these kind of environments. So we'd like to eventually investigate if, uh, what kind of pr um, contribution seabed variability has. And, um, there's also some other uh, applications such as better understanding acoustic clutter in reverberation measurements. So that is important applications for sonar um, and also some other engineering or geological or even biological processes in uh, seabed sediments. So the, the kind of classic experiment that we've been doing for uh, about last 10 years perhaps is that um, to, uh, to measure the reflectivity of the seabed and then try to, from those measurements, infer the sediment structure is that we have a ship that tows a source and we have a, a single receiver that is mounted in the lower third of the water column and the ship kind of bangs away with the source and uh, the receiver will uh, record the direct arrival and then a little bit later um, a, a, a bottom interacted path 
And these are measurements, uh, the geometry is designed such as that it's only a single bounce, if you think of it, and raise a single bounce of the seabed, a single interaction. So it's not a, a long range interaction with the seabed. And, and the interest here is, is to kind of limit the footprint of this method on the seabed. And then the ship moves to a different location and does this many times, and that gives us a, a data set that looks such as this here. So these are seismoacoustic recordings um, as a function of, of range, essentially. And we can see here, this is uh, uh, the direct arrival. I cut it off up here, but it kind of comes in like this. And then some you know, more complicated structure that interacted with the bottom, and then some uh, multiples that are due to just kind of uh, uh, more than one bounce. And we can then kind of time window this data to process it into uh, uh, the, the data that we're interested in to carry our inference uh, out. And, and that is reflection coefficient data as a function of frequency and angle. And we do that because it allows us with relatively uh, low computational demand to, um, uh, to analyze fairly complex environments. We, we don't have to do any arrival picking or uh, amplitude picking as in other geophysical methods. And we also don't have to worry about the source spectrum and, and, and other complicated things. And uh, it also allows us to look at, at structures that are below the typical uh, pulse resolution of an acoustic source. So now, um, so I said this is kind of the, the uh, an experiment that we've done quite a bit. So recently we've been then interested in examining uh, mesoscale variability and this experiment isn't very practical for that because you would have to move, move this uh, mounted, seabed mounted receiver every time and then go over with the ship or do it again. So we um, started going to a, a towed source and array configuration such as that you have some source that is towed and, and a, a string of receivers. And um, uh, in particular, we, uh, we do this with an autonomous uh, vehicle that is uh, very close to the, um, to the interface of interest, the seabed. And that gives us a number of advantages and, and some of them are listed here. So first of all, we have a very small footprint, which ho hopefully will kind of knock down the seabed onto manageable scales where the seabed below uh, the illuminated patch doesn't change too much within that patch, okay? So it's kind of, we hope that we can uh, um, assume a, a locally pancake type stack of layers that are uh, homogeneous. And then, um, we also hope to have negligible oceanographic effects. If you look at, um, at, at um, this problem with like in 100 or 200 meters of water, there's all kinds of nasty things that can happen um, uh, due to internal tides or internal waves where essentially the, the sound speed structure of the water changes rapidly and you uh, can't, uh, uh, or it's not tractable without uh, measuring it and it, it's very difficult. So. Um, the, one of the challenges is, is if you're this close to, the, to this uh, interface, you have to kind of account for the, the wavefront curvature. And, and we do this by looking uh, or thinking of this as the spherical wave reflection coefficient. So essentially, we're, um, with the measurement quantity here is some uh, uh, spherical uh, reflection coefficient that we can think of as a plane wave decomposition here in, in terms of the Sommerfeld integral. And, um, so now, to carry out our inference, we have to make data predictions, and we, we do that by um, solving this integral. And um, so we have, we'll have some uh, model, environmental model for, for our illuminated patch, and um, we think of that as, as the stack of layers, I'll, I'll call that XT here. And um, uh, that goes into this uh, uh, plane wave reflection coefficient um, uh, term here, and then you know there's a bunch of other things, and we can apply some numerical tricks to kind of do this efficiently, um, so that we can um, use it in an inference kind of way. So, I was going to ask a question about the flat top equation. Uh, I've seen many things like this before. Uh, can you explain norms of poverty minus sine infinity? Are these are complex data, are they? Um, yes. Yes. Okay. So we. We, so we in integrate along the real and the imaginary axis. Okay. So it's a little step. Going from the origin out, 
So you find what's two of them. I mean, you can think of, I guess, what we're looking at is, is a specular angle. And, and we kind of um, try to integrate over, uh, all the contribution that kind of all the, um, all the plane waves that contribute to this, um, to this specular angle for, for the reflection coefficient. So this is one. I'm just puzzled uh, by being imaginary. That's all. Uh, it can be, though. Yeah. Um, OK, so, so now, the, um, now we want to uh, carry out this, um, um, this sequential inference of, so now if we think of this, we collected all this data along a long track, and we want to um, uh, um, carry out the inference in an efficient manner. And, and what we are using here is, uh, is this sequential inference where we express our posterior as a, in, in a recursive way. Um, this is commonly referred to as sequential Monte Carlo methods. And um, I adapted the, the kind of a type of MATLAB um, notation here that, that is um, common in, in this book that is kind of one of the standard books on, on sequential Monte Carlo. And um, we, uh, what we are interested in essentially is this, uh, what people call the filtering distribution. So it's our, um, our uh, posterior for um, a, a, a current point in time, if you want. And the, um, as we march along this, um, this sequence, our new data is, uh, of course, introduced with a, a likelihood function here. So we interpret this uh, um, as a likelihood function of our uh, model vector xt. And the, this, the, like to solve these things, we now want to apply some, it's a, a general nonlinear um, dynamic system. And we want to uh, solve this using uh, um, numerical, uh, numerically with uh, uh, particle filters. And I talk a little bit about that in the next slide here. So um, particle filters are uh, uh, a form of important sampling where we approximate our, uh, the, the filtering distribution here with a cloud of points that we refer to as particles. And uh, each point is associated with this, this weight. And now um, one of the most uh, common and, and uh, also the most simple algorithms that you can use for this is uh, the sequential importance resampling or the bootstrap filter, which uh, is kind of given here as a little schematic. So we initialize our, um, our states here by uh, sampling them from uh, some prior distribution. And then at time t, we, um, we sample these, the, the xt from a, <coughs> excuse me, from a um, um, at, at, at transition um, probability. And once we, uh, we have done this, we can then uh, update our um, importance weights, which uh, is essentially computing the likelihood values for, sorry, for these xt, and then normalize the weights. Then in the next step, you use these weights to, to resample with replacement according to these weights, and then you proceed to a new time. Um, some, like there's several, this is kind of the, this was, I guess, the original uh, sequential algorithm. There's some um, challenges that, that uh, arise with this, and, and that one of them is that um, rapid changes in your data or in your environment are very difficult um, to track with this type of algorithm. And um, that is because it's, it's kind of the, it requires a, um, a reasonable uh, overlap of, of target distributions between steps. Otherwise, your particles will not find the new high likelihood region. And uh, the other thing is this particle impoverishment, where you can end up after several steps or many steps with a particle cloud that has largely uh, particles associated with z or close to zero weights and just one particle with a, a weight close to one. And to avoid this, uh, what we'll try to use here is that we will try to move these particles um, uh, using a combination of a near <coughs> importance sampling and uh, reversible jump Markov chain Monte Carlo where the near importance sampling is used to kind of uh, 
uh, formulate a, a sequence of interpolating distributions between our targets uh, to address the peak likelihood uh, or uh, regions where the likelihoods for uh, uh, region, high likelihood regions of two consecutive um, data sets may not overlap. And then also um, a reversible jump Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, steps um, that address model selection along the track. So if our model changes along the track, we want to pick that up. And also particle impoverishment. And I'll talk uh, uh, briefly about these two components and then uh, show you how we implemented that into uh, our algorithm that we're using. Um, so, um, and Neil, the important sampling due to uh, Radford Neil is um, it uh, defines a, a sequence of heuristic interpolating distributions. Um, and uh, originally, uh, I guess it was to uh, sample a, um, a posterior distribution also to uh, compute um, normalizing constants. And, but here we use it to uh, kind of interpolate between two distributions uh, of, of, of interest. And we can show that if we um, use such um, interpolating distributions here, that in the case of the bootstrap filter, and, and this is, um, uh, was shown by uh, Godzel and Clapp in, in the book in 2001, uh, is that this is kind of equivalent to um, this expression here, where we kind of slowly sharpen up the, um, the likelihood function um, uh, um, at this new time t. And, and so we gradually introduce the new uh, data into our problem, rather than just kind of introducing it all at, at, at once and uh, having difficulty to kind of move from the old high likelihood region to the new uh, high likelihood region. Um, AIS also gives us weights that we can then use to, to resample in, um, in our particle filter. All right, so now the, the other uh, part that we need is, is uh, the, is the is trans-dimensional uh, trans formulation of our, our model here. And we do that by um, using uh, Green's way of, of writing Bayes' rule for a trans-dimensional hierarchical model, which is uh, given by this expression here. And essentially what this does is it just kind of introduces this K indexing parameter that indexes the uh, number of, of models that you choose um, to include into your in, in, in your inference. And uh, what this does is um, that we can now interpret the state space as transdimensional or as the union of uh, over uh, uh, all the um, uh, fixed dimensional subspaces. And the, the posterior then is also transdimensional and intrinsically addresses model selection. Um, so a, as we then in our application march along the track, we hope that our data can uh, determine the layering structure and, and the, um, the number of layers that we use in the model. Um, so and we implement this um, with a, a partition model over some depth of interest. So we go from the seabed to a maximum depth of interest, uh, which this is related to how we uh, uh, time window um, our uh, seismoacoustic data into the seabed. And um, we then uh, apply this reverse, the reversible jump Markov chain to um, uh, for in the sampling. And we may introduce new layers at some depth, and then we can check with uh, Metropolis Hastings for the transdimensional case if we want to accept or reject it. So we uh, can do that again. And if we accept, sometimes we may want to propose a, a killing off of an interface and, and so on. And um, sometimes we may also wish just to kind of perturb, like keep the dimension fixed and, and perturb an inf interface. Um, and so what this does is really that we are um, using the natural parsimony that is I intrinsic to Bayes' theorem uh, to um, determine the, the structure um, that is supported by the data. 
So uh, overall, uh, it's, um, the, the algorithm uh, uh, looks then like this, as shown in the schematic here. So from when we start at a time t minus 1, uh, we have some particle cloud um, that represents our old target. And now we use um, AIS to kind of slowly introduce the new data and, and, um, and uh, move our particles over here. And then we apply resampling according to the weights or resampling with replacements. So some of these particles get multiplied. And um, we then kind of use a reversible jump Markov chain to, to nudge these particles um, uh, around a bit to, um, to properly um, uh, balance to our new um, target. And um, OK, 20 minutes. So now um, we have all the ingredients essentially in place to kind of look at some um, applications. And first of all, I'm, I'm going to show you a, a simulation that we did. So we, we, simu uh, we simulated this uh, environment that is uh, locally pancake. So you know each, um, each vertical line on this figure here, which consists of 100 70 um, uh, pings is kind of a, a, a stack of layers. That is, uh, there's no inclination or anything. They're all locally um, these pancake layers. And we, we have some uh, features in this environment that includes, first of all, we, we change the number of layers as we march along this track. And we also um, allow changes within the layers here. For example, in sound velocity, the increases within this layer. Uh, same with density in this layer. Then we have like a high velocity lens that sits here. We also try to simulate some or uh, simulate some geological um, effects that, uh, that uh, show rapid change from one step to the next. And, and this is an example here of a geological fault where everything just kind of settled by a certain amount and then got filled in with some soft sediment up here. This is an erosional channel where some current may have scoured the, uh, the seabed surface, and then it filled in with some soft uh, material again. And now, um, we, if we apply the, um, the, the particle filter to the sequence, we then get our, uh, our uh, results, and we can carry out all kinds of inferences on that. And one, one thing uh, that I show here is like the mean environment along the track that we recovered for velocity and density. These are the, the results, and this is the underlying true model that we use to generate the, the data. And we can see that it generally agrees uh, quite well. It uh, uh, picks up most features. It picks up new layers when they appear and disappear. Um, we can also. Uh, um, look at this in terms of the interface probability as a function of depth and along the track. This is of interest uh, for people in geophysics or in acoustics, in underwater acoustics that are interested in, in profiling, seismic profiling along a track. This is commonly done. Um, this is commonly uh, uh, done with uh, just kind of a. Um, a fixed sound speed that you use to convert travel time to some depth, but that is biased. And in this case, it is not. Um, we can also, uh, so in, in this, uh, I'll show a little simulation here so you can see how this kind of evolves along the track. And what I show down here is the fit to the data. The little axis are the, the uh, simulated data, and the, the red lines are the fit to the data. And this is um, the, uh, the histogram of over the k parameter, the model choice. And these are uh, the profiles in velocity versus depth, density, and attenuation. And you can see that uh, you could see if I would have maybe like this it works. Um, so you, and you can see how it's, uh, when new features will come in, it will start picking up a new layer here. And um, when, the, when this uh, fault appears, it'll, everything will kind of jump down. And um, one uh, interesting feature that will come up here is, is kind of just, uh, uh, it's interesting is when we lose this kind of high velocity um, uh, um, layer, we get kind of this window into the sediment. And you'll see that the, the uncertainty estimates for velocity and density in this uh, at depth there um, are reduced. 
and uh, you can also kind of see how the the uh, um, the number of layers is tracked along this track as as we move along. Um, okay, so now I have a couple only a couple minutes left, and I'll. Uh, I'll briefly uh, show you some preliminary results for the data that we measured on the Malta Plateau. So this is Sicily here. We are about in 150 meters water, and we uh, ran an autonomous underwater vehicle from site two to site 13. They're just arbitrary names for the sites. And this is about a distance of 14 kilometers. And we'll look at the first 1.5 kilometers of this trip, uh, of this track. And, this environment, is, as we try to indicate here, is likely more complicated uh, uh, than in our simulations and likely more complicated than we can reasonably handle with uh, computational demand um, to kind of uh, simulate the, um, the sound propagation. So uh, this will, uh, it's, it's likely results in difficult uh, uh, data errors that are due to us not being able to fully explain um, everything in our in our model. And um, these are, this is, uh, is now the, the mean environment again for velocity and density. There's a couple things we can uh, see is that there's some layers appear and then disappear. There's uh, some areas where there's perhaps changes, like there's a high velocity layer here that is picked up over uh, the, the whole track and then kind of changes in velocity. Um, at, at uh, a certain depth here, we kind of lose a lot of the sensitivity, like the uncertainty gets really large. And this is um, not surprising because we're looking at reflection coefficient and this uh, lowest part is an infinite half space. So we're kind of losing half the information because we don't have a, a lower bound on the, uh, on the interface. And we can also uh, look at this, at, uh, at these marginal profiles here again, and uh, also at the, the data misfit, um, so the, we, it's, it appears that we are reasonably uh, fitting the data and uh, we have some reasonable structure versus depth here. It's not surprising often to see an increase uh, due to compaction with depth and velocity and density. Um, if we go to uh, another uh, ping here, we have a more complicated structure um, we are still fitting the, uh, the data reasonably well. Um, we're, not, uh, we're not sure about some of these effects here, and it's, there's a, a good chance that we're not uh, properly converging at each ping, so we're working on that, which kind of brings me to the next slide, is some of the uh, challenges that we are facing with this, and I, I'd be uh, thrilled to hear some of the experts' uh, uh, comments uh, for this. So, I mean, this is a, a kind of an acoustic challenge that the, the measured data are highly informative, but only limited uh, knowledge exists about some of the features. So we see this, what we call kind of speckle in the reflection coefficient when we move along the track. And it's very consistent. It's, it really seems like a real feature, but we have no idea why it's there. And other instances where it rapidly changes from one, uh, from one data set to the next which um, we are also not sure why it happens. There's lots of uh, theories such that it could be bubbles in the sediment or gas bubbles, or it could be due to scattering and other more complicated effects. Um, because of some of these limitations, we'll probably have to uh, um, um, account for, for correlated errors in, in some uh, form, which we're currently not doing for this example. We've done this. Uh, for fixed dimensional problems, but we're not sure how to do this at this point in, in trans-dimensional problems. And um, the dimensional mixing in the reversible jump Markov chain is, is a, a real challenge. It, the, the mixing is very slow, and uh, we, we've looked at other options like Brooks uh, and others have have published several papers on advanced proposals. There's ideas of using perhaps parallel tempering to aid mixing. Um, and, and also uh, using uh, perhaps sequential Monte Carlo samplers uh, due to uh, Del Morel and Ducey and Jasper in 2006 that um, suggested that uh, they may actually be uh, uh, quite applicable to transdimensional problems and, and uh, mix better. Um, 
So with that, I'll just jump to the uh, summary here. So we, we implemented the se sequential transdimensional Mon Monte Carlo scheme to examine mesoscale uh, geoacoustic variability. It's, it's work in progress. Um, uh, the, we, we're using the, the uh, reversible John Markov chain to determine the layering structure along a track and, and uh, use AIS to, uh, uh, to address rapid changes uh, that may sometimes occur in the environment. And uh, we applied this to a challenging simulated environment. However, it seems it wasn't challenging enough uh, because the, the measured data is, is, uh, is quite complicated. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, you had a slide early on where you showed how you use the uh, uh, adaptive important sampling in with particle filtering. It had multiple steps. Um, Here? Huh. No, you had a picture actually of, of how you uh, how the, you evolve the particles there. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay, what are the steps in between there with the dashed lines? So um, this, this is kind of the, the interpolating distributions. So we are, um, we're essentially trying to introduce distributions between our two um, of interest to be able to move between them. Right. in some meaningful so that there's some overlap if if we have a, a for as uh, one step in time uh, a, uh, a high likelihood region that doesn't overlap with another uh, with a li high likelihood region at another time it's very difficult for the particles to to find these well, but you're showing the particles moving from there what's moving them what's oh we uh, we take each particle and and evolve it in in a in a trajectory essentially and, um, and you're using the, the annealed importance, or the, or the you knew using the annealing to do that, or you're yeah. Okay. So it's annealed importance that there's like a, a a marker of transition for each step to go from one, you know, to go along this trajectory, and then you end up with a um, a dist uh, like a distribution of particle or a cloud of particles. Each particle will have a weight. But it's not the state transition; it's the annealing that you're using. I'm not sure if I understand. Well, particle filtering, you use a state transition to pick the next particles. Yeah, so here, um, the, the particles are evolved along a chain. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, what sort of wavelength of sound are we talking about here? Um, we're looking at... Uh, um, I know you gave me the frequencies, but uh, yeah, so we I'm just trying to translate it. Oh, for wavelength. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, uh, this would be of the order of a meter, right? Yeah. About fifteen hundred meters per second in water. Yeah. So it depends a bit on the sediment. Yeah. What? How is about uh, the structure of the geology on that sort of scale? I mean, I'm used to seeing boulders and stuff and irregular irregularities and so on, which would really upset reflectivity. Yes. Yeah. We, we, have, um, we have observed that in quite a few sites that actually, so I should maybe give a bit of a background. The Malta Plateau here is a real uh, kind of a Navy test bed. A lot uh -huh. of people go there for experiments. Right. And so we have a lot of knowledge um, about the environment in this region. But there are um, instances of uh, um, erosional channels, for example, that have like fist-sized boulders. Mm. And we have several core measurements. Unfortunately, not yet along this track. We hope to do that if we get some money some other year. Yeah. Um, but at the, in, the, in the general area, we have several measurements. And most of uh, this area has very low f um, rainfall on the, on the uh, land mass of Sicily. So you get like really fine sediments. And um, a lot of the, the seabed will be covered in meters and meters of uh, really low velocity um, sediments. There's some examples where, this, um, where the reflection coefficient actually shows an angle of perfect intromission into the sediment where the sound speed of the uh, mm -hmm. sediment is lower than water. And so you see a lot of these really soft sediment effects. Mm. 
but yeah, there could be, um, we're not, not nowhere near that we could apply this in an environment uh, where there's volume scattering or interface scattering. We're working on that too, but. Yeah. Well, now I've touched uh, acoustic inference uh, a little bit in the past, uh, and I've wondered as well whether allowing the surfaces to be non-planar might actually help. Because you mentioned the word speckle, which yeah. has connotations of angles yeah, and scattering and things. Yeah. And maybe allowing point on the along a layer not just to have width, but to have some sort of systematic irregularity so that you yeah, so what we have data better. Well, we've I, think, I think modeling the data is probably more crucial than looking at algorithms actually in this sort of problem. Yeah, and it's, it's a big focus for us, for sure. I mean, we have worked on uh, trying to um, include some, uh, uh, some roughness on the interface um, with a certain wavelength or other uh, parameterizations. And um, it doesn't, at this point, seem to explain the kind of effects that we see. So we've done some forward modeling where we just kind of try to, you know, model what we see. And it doesn't seem to uh, fully explain some of these effects. The same with bubbles. Um, there are some uh, what people call mud vol volcanoes, which are essentially uh, heaps of mud that come from like methane, uh, methane coming up in the seabed. And that also doesn't seem to explain some of these effects. Uh, one of the things we have a little bit of an idea now uh, where the reflection coefficient just changes dramatically, um, that there's some f that we are likely uh, are crossing some form of channel that is below uh, the re resolution of our illuminated surface. And so there are some ideas what may be going on, but it, it's still tricky. And the, the inference part of, is kind of part of it um, in terms of like, knowing how well you know what, what you infer about, I guess. Uh, so uh, could you go to the picture of the different steps of the process again? There, yep. So from that, it seems like the dimensionality changes only uh, at that RJMCMC step. Uh, so that the your transition from xt minus 1 to xt doesn't involve a possible change of dimensionality? I, I know I'd like to, um, that is the case right now. Um, so right now what I'm doing is I, um, I keep the dimensions of each particle fixed in this part and just um, change it in this step. Uh -huh. And I'd, I'd like to um, extend that. I'm, I'm working on that. That's yeah, kind of it would seem more natural that, I know. that that's part of that. And then maybe um, your mixing there would uh, be improved by doing the AIS with dimension changing that's as you go. That's part of what I meant like by um, including, hopefully, using some form of temperature, uh, te temperature relation or exponent that will help in the mixing there. In the, the other thing I was wondering from the little pictures there, it seems like uh, in the AIS, you're bridging from one from the, the distribution of xt minus one given data up to t minus one to xt given data up to time t, but you're not sort of interpolating in what might seem like the obvious way, but instead broadening the distribution out and then narrowing it down again, which is the way that AIS would normally be used in other contexts. But in this context. Maybe you just want to like drag the one distribution to the other without making it wider in between. Uh, Maybe. Uh, Could, yeah. uh, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. There, I'm, I'm sure there's probably better ways of interpolating than others. Um, this, is, um, this is kind of, I guess, the first thing that we, that we came up with and, and then saw that Godzilla and Clapp did this before, so there was some reinforcement of the idea and, and before you knew it we, you know we we used it but yeah I'd like to I mean I'd like to discuss that more if it, I'm sure there are lots of good ideas uh, maybe I've missed it did you mention which likelihood you're using uh, I, I'm sorry I, I did I probably didn't um, we're assuming Gaussian um, um, errors on on the data and we have we have done, I <laughs> saw the expression, we have done some uh, posterior checks on it, um, trying to look at, at residuals and, uh, and, and testing um, what kind of uh, distribution they, um, 
they support and and it seem, doesn't seem to be a bad idea. However, uh, correlations uh, may be a, a big issue as far as we could see. Uh, that's something which surprises me. Uh, okay. Looking at the huge deviation between uh, the, let's say, okay, we can take that offline, but uh, if the model is not correctly uh, modeling the reality, then uh, using Gaussian errors is probably a very risky idea. You have yeah. strong hints that your assumed model is not correct. And at the same time, you impose a very strict uh, probability distribution of the deviation between model, which is most surely not taking all effects into account, and your measured data. Yeah, however, if you, I mean, if you, so I guess one of the things, and uh, th that's very interesting, I'd like to talk more about it. One, one thing I can mention, I guess, is that what I would expect, or one of the things I would expect is, is if I'm not uh, fully accounting for um, all the stru structure in your data, is that you would uh, have some uh, you know, correlation along, in this case, angles. Mm -hmm. right? So like, uh, we, we usually look at these as at each frequency, uh, um, and then we would get residuals as a function of angle. And if we see some correlation there, um, we, we can uh, use some Gaussian um, um, error function that accounts for those correlations. So not a diagonal matrix, but some, some covariance matrix in, in your likelihood. And we are hoping, like we've done this before in, uh, in fixed dimensional problems and it worked very well. We just don't know how to do that here. So we don't see outliers, for example. Like we don't see, when we plot the residuals, uh, we don't see huge outliers at large, um, uh, you know, of large magnitude. That's why so far we've been thinking um, that we're probably doing all right with, uh, with the Gaussian. Um, we also have in the past used uh, uh, double exponential, um, but not for this problem. So I, I'm, I'm a little bit aware of it, but yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to hear more about it. Any other questions? I'm kind of amazed that you can calculate the summer field integral for each of your model evaluations and actually do this because that usually is numerically really intensive. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, what we do, um, so this is, oh, where is it? Th this is actually, it's, it's commonly done in, in some, some uh, acoustic um, propagation models such that I'm not sure if you're familiar with OASIS, but it's one of the uh, standard packages that you use for uh, computing sound propagation in in the water, and it, it would do um, it would do just that. What and we've used that in the past, and we actually by kind of implementing it ourselves, we it it worked out to be a little bit faster. It's about uh, 0.1 seconds, I think, for a typical stack of layers um, that this takes on a on a single core, you know, like a normal. PC type thing. We, we run this whole thing on a cluster as a parallel code. Um, but so 0.1 seconds, it's, it's we're, compared to just using the plane wave reflection coefficient, not, so not solving this integral, um, we are about a, a factor of 20 slower right now. And we started out a factor of about 500 slower, but you know, with certain things like, for example, you, the sampling and angle here, you can uh, uh, you can try to choose that such that um, you know your sample. This the uh, this Bessel function here is the most rapidly oscillating part in this integral. So we choose it, the sampling according to that for to satisfy Nyquist. But then this part here, the the plane wave reflection coefficient doesn't um, really fluctuate that much. So we downsample that by a factor of something. We, which depends a little bit on the model. So we have some empirical way that seems to work. And we kind of regularly double check that we're not, you know, we, we don't have any crazy models that come in. 
Any other question? Okay, let's thank the speaker then. Thank you.